educational, or I should say the training portion, product training portion of our call. Let me find our guest speaker here real quick. Give me one second. Ted, I see you. Let me first unmute you. Good morning, Ted. Good morning. Excellent. Are you ready to go, sir? I am ready. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. Okay. With that, guys, let me uh, move this slide over. Let me introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Ted Lindsay, from our number one carrier, Transamerica. Going to bring bringing some great value to us today. There you go, Ted. I just sent you a message for you to accept. I just did. Yep. Awesome. Guys, uh, this is get ready. This is going to be a uh, a great, great uh, part of our call. A lot of agents have uh, have been asking for this. There's a lot of interest in writing more Index Universal Life, and Transamerica, uh, quite honestly, has one of the best products I've ever seen, and it's their FFIUL. It's the uh, Financial Foundation Index Universal Life. And with that, Ted, let me turn the call over to you, sir. Excellent. So is everyone seeing a picture of uh, some people lying in bed with a little kid sitting up? Yes, I do. Um, the only thing, maybe I can maximize it. On my side, it's uh, only taken up a small portion of the screen. Ah. Let me see here. Is there a way to um, make it bigger? See if I can. Let's see if I can make the uh, thing bigger. Okay. Come on. Uh, show screen. I don't know if I'm showing the right screen. Are you still seeing the people lying in bed? No, I'm. I'm. Um, uh, looks are, like. Are you the, seeing something that says transact? Yeah, transact. Okay, there we go. Let me switch screens. There we go. How's that? Better. Thank you. Perfect. Good. All righty. So welcome everyone. My name is Ted Lindsay. I'm an internal wholesaler on the Life Sales Desk for Transamerica. I'm here to uh, assist with pre-sales activities, and I have eight other colleagues who do the same thing. We have the nation split up into different territories, uh, and I actually cover the states of Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota. So if you're in one of those three states, I am your um, internal partner. So what we're going to be talking about this morning is um, our Financial Foundation Indexed Universal Life Policy. For those of you who uh, sell primarily final expense insurance, this is a, a bit of a leap, but it doesn't need to be daunting. Uh, it, it sounds like it's this big, huge, complicated product, and let me simplify it as much as I can. This is permanent insurance written on a universal life platform, whereas our final expense is written on a whole life platform. This is written on a universal life platform, and it's tied to an index, and we're going to be talking about these ind indexes, indices, throughout the, uh, the talk this morning. So let's move on. So our FFIUL product was the number one selling index universal life product for 14 consecutive quarters. It combines protection uh, features that your clients need, like uh, death benefit, long-term care rider, it has critical and chronic illness living benefit listed as riders, but those are features that are built into the cost of the policy, so they're not an extra cost. And then it has, uh, of course, cash value, like all universal life policies do, and the potential for in, uh, excess interest, in, excess index interest crediting. Yeah, I say that five times fast. Mm -hmm. So let's walk through, let's walk through this together. Well, let's take a look at some of our key features and our strengths. We're going to look at how interest is credited, our long-term care rider, and then our critical chronic and terminal illness living benefit riders. Now, the crediting interest part is the part that a lot of folks get hung up on. They don't know how to explain it to their uh, clients. 
Uh, Joe, after after we're done this morning, I'll make sure that you have a copy of the um, of a flyer that was sent out by our marketing department uh, over the past couple of weeks. It was an update on how to explain our crediting strategies. And many agents have told me that not only did it make it easier for them to explain the crediting of this particular product, but uh, many agents have told me that they learned something from the flyer too. Just a little one page thing, very simple, but I'll make sure that you get that after the call and you can distribute it uh, to all the folks that you need to. Perfect. So, so let's begin with crediting interest. Excess indexed, excess indexed interest is what allows the policy's cash value to grow above the guaranteed minimum rate. Everything from the death benefit to the potential for cash value accumulation to the specified amount, that's the face value of the policy, of the long-term care rider uh, can be affected by the amount of interest that is credited to a policy. And you'll see here caps of 13.75% for the S&P 500 index, a cap of 15% on the global index, and both of these have a floor of 0.75%. So even if the market went negative, the client is still attributed three quarters of 1% of interest in that given year. And if the market is positive, uh, let's say that the uh, global index was positive by 18% year over year, next year versus this year, the client's going to enjoy 15 of those 18 percentage points. So a really nice thing. Our crediting interest, when I look at IULs, I think it's important to know how interest is credited. You know, there are a lot of IULs that have smoke and mirrors, uh, stuff that is so difficult to explain that you don't understand it and neither does your client. So it's important to the entire index universal life, from the death benefit to the cash value to the long-term care rider to the living benefit rider uh, and the client's potential supplemental retirement income. So the FFIUL product has a basic interest account and two index in, uh, account options. Both index account credit uh, for any, any excess interest excess index interest, if there's that good phrase again, using an annual point-to-point -point method up to a specified ca uh, cap. The annual point-to-point -point is the industry's most common crediting uh, method. It's used with almost 84% of index universal life products that are sold. So along with uh, Transamerica's FFIUL, there are no spreads, there are no buy-ups, there are no plus accounts, there are no multi-year options. So again, it makes it simple for you to understand. Uh, more importantly, simple for your clients to understand. Hey, if your policy goes into effect July 1st of this year, we're going to look from July 1st, 2019 until June 30th of 2020 and see how the global index did. Or if they're tied to the S&P, how the S&P index did. And then you will get up to the cap that's associated with that particular in, uh, index. To illustrate this, we really have three different options. You've got a fixed account or your basic interest account. That's this one, the 2% one, with a minimum guaranteed interest rate of 2%. You have the S&P 500, that's this one right here, with a floor of three quarters and a cap of 13.75%. And then you have the global index account with the same floor, three quarters of 1%, but a cap of 15%. Now, the illustrated rate, when we run an illustration for one of your clients, you're going to see year after year after year, 7.75% illustrated in every single year. And that's just, again, that's how all IULs typically will run the illustration because we can't predict the highs and lows of how the uh, uh, index is going to, uh, how it's going to perform over time. So we just average it. And this average is not just an average that we pulled out of our hat, it's based on a 25-year look back with each of these two different uh, ind indices, the S&P 500 and the global. So the 7.75% is actually a, um, a conservative estimate of what's happened over the past 20 years with each of these indexes uh, using today's caps and floors. So let's take a quick, closer look at these accounts. The domestic account is pretty straightforward. Excess index interest is based on changes in the value of the S&P 500 index. 
The global index account is pretty interesting. It's based on a weighted average of changes in the S&P 500, the Euro stocks 50, and the Hang Seng. So you'll see that the Hang Seng has a constant 20%. The, S the Euro stocks 50 or the S&P 500 will be attributed 50%, depending on which one did better in that year. And then the one that did not do quite as well but will be attributed 30%. So if you have a client who says, well, I want to split it between the S&P 500 and the, uh, and the global, my question would be why, because now you're double dipping on the S&P 500 and you're splitting um, what your cap might be. So if, if the global index did really well that year, you won't be able to enjoy all of the uh, all of the gains in that particular index. But certainly they can if they want to. So on the segment anniversary, the percentage change is calculated separately for each index. We give a weighting of 50% to the higher of the S&P 500 or the Eurostoxx 50 index change and 30% to the lower of the two. So, for example, if the S&P performs better than the Eurostox 50 for a particular segment period, it would be weighted at 50%, and the Eurostox 50 would be weighted at 30%. The Hang Seng percentage is always weighted at 20. We compare the index change percentage or the weighted average uh, change for the global index to the cap and the floor. The excess interest crediting rate will never be higher than the cap or lower than zero. So the guaranteed interest is credited uh, monthly during the segment period. Now, it's important for all of you to know uh, and to explain to your clients that their premiums are not invested in any of these indices. That's not where their premiums are going. The premiums are invested in AAA-rated bonds, long, good, uh, solid long-term care investments or long-term investments, but... Um, uh, it's tied to the index. So we're not investing in the index, but the performance of their uh, policy is going to be tied to the index. So here's a great at a glance view. Notice on the far right that our default maximum interest rate is 7.75%, the default rate, meaning that you can run illustrations at rates up to 7.75% for either in index account option. And that's typically where we run them. Shown here is a brochure that you can use with a consumer brochure, uh, and it's a hypothetical overview of how the cap and floor work. Take a look at the 20-year average. It's hard to see with as small as it. Whoops, sorry. Let me back up. Hard to see with. Uh, let's see if I can make this bigger. Uh, zoom in. Oh, there we go. I can make it bigger. Perfect. There we go. So you're going to see with this one. In 1997, the 20-year uh, look back, the, in 1997, the S&P went up 31%, 98, 26%, 99, 19 and a half percent. And then we had the down years, 2000, 2001, 2002. But with today's caps and floors, the client still would have made three quarters of 1% in those three down years. And then again, went up by 26%, 9%, almost 5%, almost 12 and so on. And the weighted average down at the bottom was 8.01%. And we're, and we're illustrating a 7.75. So again, important for you to understand and to be able to explain to the client, this is a conservative estimate. We didn't just pull a number out saying, oh, we want to beat company A or company B. It's based on our own caps and floors. So having a cap and floor strategy can make a big difference. All right, now why can't I move on? There we go. All right. Okay, so let's talk about something I think really differentiates us from the competition, and that is our long-term care rider. Now, before I discuss the rider, there's one caveat to that. You are not allowed to discuss the long-term care rider, nor can you illustrate it unless you are long-term care certified in your state. What that typically means in most states is that you have taken the long-term care partnership training course. It's called the NAIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, NAIC partnership training course. That can typically be done online, and the initial course is an eight-hour course. Well, that eight hours counts towards your 24 hours that you need every other year for your life and health license anyway. 
Uh, but if you have not taken that course, just skip over the long-term care writer part because you can't offer it and you're not allowed technically to discuss it with your clients. But if you have that course or if you've, you're in the process of taking it, it's one of the most important features uh, of our uh, uh, Index Universal Life product. The writer, uh, the, one of the most important features is that the long-term care writer, uh, long-term care benefit has the potential to grow. So if someone chooses the long-term care rider, they can start out at $100,000 of death benefit, and we can build a plan for the same premium amount. We can build a plan with an increasing death benefit. And if the uh, client chooses that, then let's say it's 10, 15, 20 years down the road, and then they have a long-term care event, well, their death benefit has grown from $100,000 to $300,000. Now they're, the amount that they can take out is 2% of the death benefit of what it's grown to at that time. So they've gone from $2,000 a month of long-term care benefit to $6,000 a month of long-term care benefit. It's a way really to build some inflation protection into the long-term care rider. Keep in mind that when I'm talking about long-term care, I'm not talking about a place. This does not have to do with nursing home care. It doesn't have to do with assisted living facility care. Most clients are going to use the long-term care benefit in their own home. So they must need assistance by another person, just like with standalone long-term care insurance. They must need assistance by another person to perform at least two of six activities of daily living, and they must have already needed that assistance for 90 days or more uh, before the policy will start to pay but then it's going to pay, and it's an indemnity-style policy. So for those of you who have not sold long-term care insurance before, there are two types. There's reimbursement and there's indemnity. Reimbursement, you have to show receipts. Indemnity, you do not. So with this long-term care rider, the client does not have to show receipts. Uh, they can get their care from anywhere, with one exception. Uh, the policy will not pay for a family member to be their caregiver. So. This isn't designed to put the family member on the payroll, but they don't have to use a licensed home health agency. They can pay their next door neighbor. They can pay uh, a good friend of theirs from church. If they're comfortable with that person coming into their home and helping them to get out of bed, get a shower, get dressed in the morning, then that person can be paid. Uh, uh, and usually that's worked out between the policy holder or their family member and, uh, and the person who's providing the care. So the long-term care rider <clears throat> specified amount is always equal to the policy's face amount. If you start with a half million dollar face amount, uh, the long-term care benefit is, is a half million dollars. If you choose an increasing death benefit, and down the road your policy's um, face amount has grown to $800,000, your long-term care rider benefit will increase from that 500 original to the 800,000 possibly keeping up with or even even outpacing inflation. It has a $2 million limit at issue, but no cap on the growth. So if the death benefit grew from $2 million to $3 million and a client met the criteria by being certified as chronically ill by a licensed healthcare practitioner, usually their primary care doctor, the amount to use for qualified long-term care expenses would be 2% of $3 million. Another feature that agents like is the fact that it is uh, that that it's the indemnity style that we just talked about, and that just means once you've qualified, we're going to pay the full long-term care rider benefit, subject to HIPAA maximums, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, subject to HIPAA maximums, no matter what your expenses were. So if the expenses were a thousand dollars that month, but the benefit is three thousand dollars, they're going to get get a check for three, that's going to cover their expenses and they can put the other two in the bank or they can use it to pay for unpaid medical expenses or for other bills that they might have. Now let's discuss for just a minute what the HIPAA maximums are. HIPAA maximums today for a long-term care event are in the neighborhood of $380 a day. Let me get my little calculator out here. Come on calculator, 380 times 30. That's, that's not right, 380 times 30, that's $11,400 a month. That's an awful lot of care. 
So if uh, a person needs more care than that or if their policy has grown beyond that, we're only going to pay up to the HIPAA maximums. Well, why would we do that? Well, because if we're paying more than the HIPAA maximum, the client could incur a taxable event. So we don't want the client to be taxed on their long-term care benefits. So that's why the HIPAA maximum is kind of an important thing if they have the long-term care rider. Now let's go over another great feature of our FFIUL, the living benefit riders. For the living benefit features that are built into the cost of the policy, you do not have to have long-term care certification. So the living benefits are critical illness and chronic illness. Why do we even talk about those? Well, this is no news to anyone that's on the call. People are living longer and facing more health challenges today than ever before. In four, every 40 seconds, someone in the United States has a heart attack or a stroke. 40 seconds. Every 30 seconds, someone's being diagnosed with a new case of cancer. But thanks to advances in medical technology, people are surviving these crises. Now, I'm old enough that I remember that if you had one of the big three, heart attack, cancer, stroke, and it was in the early to mid-60s, it was a death sentence. You were going to die. People did not survive their heart attack, or if they did, they would have a second heart attack that would take their lives. If they survived the first stroke, they'd have a second stroke uh, with a 70% likelihood, and if the first stroke didn't kill them, the second stroke would. If they were diagnosed with cancer, people were so scared of the, the C word because it all, almost always in the 60s meant that at some point, sooner or later, uh, the person was going to expire because of the cancer. None of those things are true for any of those three um, major health problems today because of advances in medical science. Now, here's a very, very sad statistic. According to, the Penny Insur according to Penny Insurance, the chances of surviving, surviving a heart attack is about 60%. Chances of surviving a stroke is around 70%. And for some cancers, the survival rate is about 90%. So it doesn't, but that doesn't mean that, that the impact is any less, less devastating. The direct cost of a heart attack is nearly $110,000. And healthcare costs associated with heart failure are expected to double in about 11 years by 2030. One in eight cancer patients, hear this one well, one in eight cancer patients who's younger than 65 when they're diagnosed delay or refuse treatment due to the high associated costs. We all know, those of you who are paying for your own health insurance, you know how expensive uh, premiums are for health insurance. I paid for my own health insurance for the last 20 years. And every year, my health insurance didn't go up a little bit. It went up by 10% or more. Multiply that by 20 years, and you come up with a pretty large premium. Not only did my premium go up, but my coverage went down, and my copay and my uh, out-of-pocket expense went up every single year. So you can see why one in eight cancer patients delay or refuse treatment due to the high associated costs. <clears throat> and then, of course, we come to the, the um, elephant in the room, and that's Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is one of the most expensive diseases for Americans age 65 or older. Costs families and society $236 billion. That was three years ago in 2016. So the costs associated with these illnesses and health issues can put a strain, a serious strain on finances. Now, before we talk about this slide, how serious of a strain can it put on uh, finances? Well, uh, I've seen statistics that are up to 60% of all bankruptcies in the United States have to do with uh, a person's change in their, in their uh, health, had to do with medical expenses. I can tell you from personal experience, my own father-in-law paid for his first wife's um, cancer care for almost 20 years after she died. She died when uh, their children were very, very young. My wife was eight years old when she lost her mother due to complications from advanced breast cancer. But he paid on, uh, had to pay on her, the, the associated cost, the part that his insurance didn't pay, and he worked for Ford. I mean, this man, this is in the 60s. The man had good insurance, but uh, didn't pay for everything. So this is why we've added living benefits to our Financial Foundation Index Universal Life product at no additional premium to your client. 
With a living benefit rider option, you're able to present clients with the ability to access a portion of their death benefit early if they become stricken with a serious illness, such as a qualifying chronic critical or terminal illness. The FFIUL offers critical chronic and terminal illness living benefit features, and like the long-term care rider, they can also grow with the death benefit within limits. It's also good to note that the terminal illness rider is automatically included on all policies, then the chronic and critical illness and long-term care riders are optional, and they do require additional underwriting. So there are some clients that will be approved for the Index Universal Life product, but perhaps do not qualify for the long-term care rider or for the living benefits based on certain uh, health conditions. Uh, uh, to give you an example, a person who has uncontrolled diabetes uh, or poorly controlled diabetes uh, may be able to get coverage with a, a big table rating, but uh, may not be able to qualify for the living benefits. A person with rheumatoid arthritis who's using uh, narcotic pain meds more than three times a week may be able to qualify for the, the death benefit of the IUL product, but may not qualify for the living benefits. Oh, oh and by the way, you can have the critical illness rider and the long-term care rider at the same time. You can't have the chronic illness and long-term care rider at the same time because, um, uh, because they, they basically cover the same things. But you'll see the death benefit around the outside, uh, critical, terminal, chronic illness. Now, the way the, the living benefits work, the critical and the chronic illness benefits, is that the client can accelerate up to 90% of the face amount of their policy. Typical with a critical illness, that's going to be paid out in a lump sum. Whereas with a chronic illness, it could be paid in a lump sum, but it's usually paid out in a on a monthly basis. And the critical illness is highly dependent upon how much that critical illness, heart attack, cancer, stroke, and a few others that are mentioned in the uh, product brochure, but how much that critical illness impacted the client's overall lifespan. So let me, let me give you a quick example. Two clients have a heart attack. Client A has a heart attack, and six weeks after the heart attack, he's back at work, back enjoying his leisure activities, out on the golf course, playing tennis, and the doctor says, hey, Joe, you were really lucky. Um, there's no damage to your heart muscle. We put a couple of stents in, opened up your blood vessels there, and, uh, and you should live a long and healthy life. And, you, and you've changed your diet. We've got you on a blood thinner medication, but uh, you're good to go. That client may not accelerate any of his uh, death benefit as part of the living benefit uh, critical illness. Client number two has a heart attack, and six months later, he's still not back at work. And odds are he may never return to work. He is winded walking across the family room. He's um, told by his doctor, hey, uh, Sam, you had significant damage to your heart muscle. And, uh, you know, you better get your affairs in order because, gosh, if you have a second heart attack, I may not be able to bring you back. Oh, okay. So that client may have may be able to accelerate up to 90% of the face amount of his policy because his lifespan was impacted by his heart attack. So if someone has a heart attack, cancer, or stroke, it doesn't automatically mean that they're going to be able or, or even want to accelerate some of their death benefit. But if they're off from work for a while, um, it, it's going to help replace some lost income. It's going to help to pay for some of the um, medical expenses that were not covered by, the, by their health insurance and so on. All right, I'm going to stop there. We're going to we're going to look at two quick illustrations, but before we do so, are there any questions about living benefits, the long-term care rider, or this product in general? Anyone on the call uh, have a question that uh, uh, Joe, you could relate to me? Got it. Let me just see, Jimmy. Do you have any questions? No, I sure don't. Let's see. I. Uh... Ted, at this point, no, I don't see any question marks. Okay, so let me show you an illustration. I'm going to show you two because Joe asked me to uh, to discuss tax-free retirement uh, benefits and college planning. So I'm going to show you two, and some of this is based on uh, feedback from some of your fellow agents across the country, and some of it is just based on uh, how our product uh, happens to work. So the first client I'm looking at, and I know that you guys deal mostly with seniors, but most of these seniors will have adult children. So you might be able to 
um, interest their adult children in, in some kind of a policy like this. So the adult child, the 40-year-old, says, well, gee, I know you sold a final expense policy, uh, $15,000 policy to my, my mom who's 70, but um, I want more than $25,000 worth of coverage. Um, do you have any kind of per- permanent insurance where I can get 75000 or $100,000? Yeah, you do. It's this. It's the Financial Foundation IUL product. So here's a healthy 40-year-old 40, 40 female in the state of Illinois, preferred health. You know that because you've done a little bit of uh, chatting with her. You found that she doesn't use any prescription medications. She doesn't have any significant medical history. Uh, everything's good from a health history standpoint with her family. And she said um, to you, hey, you know, um, Ted, I want to look at $200,000 worth of insurance. Could you tell me what that would cost? So guideline level death benefit target premium solved, face amount of $200,000. The only thing I put in under premium specifications is to put in a monthly premium mode. And now we're going to go down here to reports and summary. By the way, summary is for you guys. It's not something you can share with the clients. And what does $200,000 worth of coverage cost for this lady? It costs her $186 a month. Pretty reasonable cost for $200,000 worth of coverage. Now, remember, we ran this with a level death benefit. And I just want to show you quickly. Make it bigger. There we go. Just want to show you quickly how the cash value grows. She was only 40 when she bought it. And she wants to know, by the time I'm retirement age, what will I have in terms of cash value? So she's paid less than $200 a month. And she's got $86,428 of cash surrender value in her policy. It's right here. She's paid in $55,800 in premium, but she's got $86,428, and you'll see that there's her uh, constant uh, death benefit. If she lives long enough, if she lives beyond age 74, her death benefit is automatically going to start to grow because her cash surrender value is starting to approach the death benefit. So we didn't ask for it to grow, but it's got to grow. Again, rules on how this kind of policy works. And if she decides at age, oh, let's say at age 75, that she wants to take some money out, she's got nearly $200,000 in here, and she can take that money out, and any money that she takes out is tax-free. So a really nice thing for the client. We can even illustrate it. So let me go back a page. And again, Ted, just real quick, this illustration – that premium, that's only the target premium. You're really not even overfunding it at this point. Oh, not at all. No, not at all right. overfunding okay. it. Right. Yep. So let me show you a quick thing with this client, then I'm going to show you a child client. So the quick thing with this client is we're going to have her stop paying at age 65. And under income options, we can show some income coming out. Let's say at age 70, she wants to take in some income out for... 10 years until she's 80. So between 70 and 80, she wants to take out $5,000 a year. This is all going to be tax-free money, remember. So now we go to summary. We look at it again. And we scroll down here to show, hey, here's her premium amount. It stopped at age 65. Here's the money coming out. We asked for 5,000, it took out 5,025 for um, 11 years, from age 70 to age 80. You'll see that it did have an impact on her death benefit, but even though she's not paying premiums anymore, after 10 years of money coming out, she still got 159,566 of uh, death benefit, and she still got another almost $152,000 of cash surrender value in her policy. So if she needed to take money out for one reason or another later on, she could. But, uh, you know, this is just to illustrate and show how and every penny of this that she's taken out has uh, come out tax-free. So this is all tax-free money. All right. Any questions about this particular young lady? Well, that il- that illustrates really, really well. Hey, um um, no, I mean, I don't have any questions. I have a pretty good understanding on uh, on how these work. I guess I just want to make the point is that in this scenario that we're running, I just want agents to understand is that um, 
it, you know, that premium of $187, she could put in a lot more if she had the uh, financial capacity to really, you know, overfund this and, and, you know, really turn it into something pretty special. Yeah, so let's say that she's in a job that once a year her employer uh, gives her an end-of-the-year bonus gives her a $5,000 bonus. And after taxes and stuff, she's taken home maybe $3,500 of that or $3,800. And she decides that at the end of the year, she wants to throw an extra $1,000 into this uh, life insurance policy. That's just going to make all these numbers look all the better. And she would have significantly more cash surrender value in her policy at, at a given age if she did that. Oh, let's say she did it once every five years. It's just going to make her cash surrender value uh, grow grow faster, better, and make the policy look even uh, more robust than what it already does. So another question that we get frequently is, hey, um, we've got a parent who has a five-year-old, and she wants to take out a uh, permanent life insurance policy on the five-year-old. Now, you'll see this, of course, on the final expense side, and that's great. And on the final expense side, I would strongly encourage you, if you're not already doing this, uh, run a regular illustration for that five-year-old, but also run an illustration with a 10-pay. And then you can explain to the parent or the grandparent, whoever's paying for it, um, hey, if you pay every year for a lifetime, here's what it would cost for 20000 or 30000 whatever they're looking at in, in face amount, death benefit for the, for the child. Um, but if you did a 10 pay, might add just a, a fraction of a uh, of a percentage of cost to the monthly um, a premium amount, and in 10 years it's paid off. So by the time the kid's 15 years old, before she graduates high school, she'll have a paid up whole life policy. So that's that's the final expense side. But on the uh, index universal life side, the question that we frequently have here here at the desk is, well, the mom wants to take out a policy for the child and wants to be able to use the cash surrender value to pay for college expenses. Oh, okay. Well, does she have a specific dollar amount that she wants to pay in premium? Well, no, she doesn't have anything in mind, but she wants to look at what $100,000 of uh, death benefit, what that would be. So let me show you that first. So here's $100,000 of death benefit death benefit uh, for this child it costs a whopping $35 a month so it, it's really a bargain but let's look when the child is is uh, age 18 13 years from now there's uh, if the if the parent is only paying in that $35 a month there is a whopping $1,100 worth of cash surrender value in this client's uh, um, uh, account and that's not going to pay for college. So what's a better plan? Well, is mom taking out a policy? Yes, she was that 40 year old that we just looked at. Okay, so let's go back to her for just a second. So there's the 40 year old. Remember she was in preferred health and she was looking at a couple hundred thousand dollars. So let's look 18 years into the future for this 40-year-old and see what her cash surrender value is. 18 years into the future, she's got, oh, she's got $45,323 in her policy, and that's without overfunding it. If she overfunds it, she might have sixty, seventy, even $80,000 of cash value, pays a little bit more per year or per month into her policy. So it makes much more sense for mom to overfund her policy uh, than, it, than it does to at least to have the express reason of the five-year-old having a, an index universal life policy of that cash surrender value at college time because there just won't be enough money in the cash uh, surrender part of that for the child. First of all, there's only uh, 13 years before he or she will be in college, so it's not enough time for it to grow significantly. And secondly, we're putting in such a small premium amount, $35 a month. Now, if mom wanted to pay 100 bucks a month into the child's policy, of course, the cash surrender value would have grown more. But generally speaking, no matter how young the child is, let's say the kid's 10 years old, now there's only eight years worth of growth, it's just not enough time to rev up the engine of an IUL, of an index product, 
to pay for college. Now, if the, if the parent's goal is for the child to have a good base of life insurance, oh, I want my child to have $100,000 worth of life insurance. Oh, great. Well, and then the child's going to take over the payments after he finishes college. So at age 21 or at age 25, he starts taking over the payments. Then it's a great way to do it. So no problem with a child having an IUL product. We just need to be clear about uh, what it can and cannot do. The other thing to keep in mind with a, uh, with a child's policy, if the child is younger than 18, there will be no living benefits built into the cost of the policy because they're not available for someone under, eight, under age 18. However, when the child turns 18, they can fill out some paperwork, basically a statement of good health and some of that kind of stuff, and go through some additional underwriting at age 18 or 21, whenever they want to do it, and we can add the, the uh, living benefits into that, that person's IUL policy. So I hope that that just gives you a flavor. Please do not be put off by what, at this point in your careers, if, especially if you're a brand new agent, if this sounds very daunting, if it sounds very complicated, that's what... Uh, Joe's there for and his crew, and it's also what we're here for here at the Life Sales Desk. We will help you run the illustrations based on the information you're able to gather from the client. We can run it with a particular dollar amount of premium. We can run it for the client to play pre pay premium for a certain number of years. We can run it with a certain death benefit if that's what's important to the client. You know, often you'll have a client who may say to you, um, hey, I've got $150 a month that I could put into a product like that, but that's all, not a penny more. You tell me how much that'll buy me. Well, depending on the age of the client, that might, might buy them a lot of coverage, but if the client's 65, it may not be enough. So it just depends, you know, again, on what the age of the client is, what their goals are, what they're looking for, and uh, we can help develop the uh, illustration in such a way that it's going to um, try to meet those goals as, as uh, succinctly as possible. And if we find that we can't meet them, of course, we're going to be honest and, and tell you that. Oh, well, I'm sorry. If the client's only got $40 a month and they're 70 years old, this just isn't the right product for them. They really need to buy term life insurance instead. Oh, okay. And then we can, we can show them a term quote and show them what that would be. So that's an awful lot of information in a very short period of time. I thank you for the uh, the opportunity to chat with you. If you have further questions, by all means, reach out to Joe. But uh, also, feel free to call into the Life Sales Desk. For those of you who have pens poised, the toll-free number to the Life Sales Desk is 866. Of course, I go brain dead right when I'm trying to tell you. 866-545-9058. 866 9058 Five four five nine zero five eight, and anyone that answers the phone can answer questions about the product, can answer questions you might have about living benefits, uh, can can run an illustration, anything that you need. Perfect, perfect. What? Um, just one real quick thing before um, bef before we uh, let you go, and this has been really really, really great um, information, guys. Uh, this is a fantastic project. If you need help running an illustration, I can help you, or literally you can just call in to the, uh, the sales desk and Transamerica is wonderful for uh, helping agents run illustrations. Just the one thing I'll make a, a comment on, on Ted and um, verify whether or not this is true or not, we could actually run an illustration, but here's what I have found. If, if a client is, you know, really serious about putting money into a policy perhaps to not fully pay for education but to help supplement a college education when i've ran illustrations compared to let's say you have a child who's you know three four five years old or an adult here's what i have found in my illustrations is that it doesn't really matter if 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 I have a client that can afford to pay $300 a month, as an example, it doesn't matter if the client's five years old or 40 years old, the cash value will be the same approximately within about $1,000. It'll be the same in a 10 to 15 year period as long as I'm um, minimizing the death benefit. In other words, 
if I have a if I have a client who has a uh, let's say a five year old and they can afford to pay three hundred dollars a month, well, if I use uh, if I use the minimum death benefit, that may be five hundred thousand dollars worth of of life insurance. But if the client's forty, that three hundred dollars a month, it may only be you know a hundred thousand dollars of life insurance. The, the $300 a month is $300 a month, any way you slice it. And the cash value will be virtually the same after that time period. It doesn't matter the age of the client. I think that's a fair statement, Joe. And, and again, that goes to um, as much information as you can give us when we're looking at the product and running an illustration and those kinds of things. Right. Then there are lots of different solves that we can use. We can solve for base amount. We can solve for premium amount. We can put in minimum death benefit, maximum income solve. We can solve it in a lot of different ways. So the more information you have up front about uh, what's important to the client, what kind of budget they have for it and those kinds of things, then we can run the numbers accordingly. And, and uh, you know, if mom's taking out a policy or dad is and uh, they want something for a child as well, then we can add the child as a as a rider in the um, on the IUL policy. We can run a, a, a separate IUL for the child, him or herself, uh, and we can look at you know whatever options might be available. So there are, there are lots of different ways to look at it, and uh, you know there's no one answer that's always the right answer in every situation. Just just depends on um, what your client's looking for. Right. And typically, you know, when I'm when I'm doing a plan like this and and they really do kind of want to use it to, you know, supplement college, I typically try to put the insurance on the parent um, yeah. just because and, and then, you know, because you could always put an IUL on the child like that illustration you ran. Yeah. A hundred thousand dollars for thirty five bucks a month. They can probably afford to do two policies at that point. But the reason why I like putting it on the parent is, God forbid, you know, mom or dad passes away that month that, you know, that kid still may want to go to college. And, um, uh, you know, that that face amount of one hundred or two hundred thousand dollars can be used to set up an education fund for that kid to be able to go to college versus if all the death benefit is on the child and the child passes away. Uh, what you know? What are the parents? You know, what, you know they're not going to be able to use it for education at that point. So, um, when all possible, now in some cases, what I've found is the parents really want to take out the 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 insurance, but in some cases they're just not insurable because of right. health situations. And in that case, maybe it does make more sense to put, you know, a bigger policy on the child and just overfund the uh um the heck out of it but guys we can we can help you customize any illustration transamerica on their back end they have they have more solves than i've ever seen in my life you can you can solve <laughs> i'm still learning anything. them joe yeah i'm still learning the solves yep i know it's pretty crazy but it, it's a it's a fantastic product so it's a nice solution, again, just to summarize and simplify, it's a nice solution if your client wants permanent insurance and they want a face amount greater than $50,000, we can go as low as $25,000, uh, then certainly the product that we were, are going to be looking at is our financial foundation IUL product. So if they write below $100,000 of initial face amount, if the client is younger than, if they're 50 years old or younger, Anything below $100,000, oh, by the way, is a non-medical face amount. So no paramed exam, no medical records obtained, typically, and it's just, it's accelerated underwriting, and, uh, you know, those kinds of cases typically sail right through. Oh, Ted, can I ask a question about that? So if I have a client yeah. who's 45 years old, and you say under 100000 so I need to write it at $99,999? Yep, that's right. Okay, so then um, express underwriting, is there, what, what um, when I'm doing the illustration, uh, is there still a chance they could get like a preferred rate or is there like, no. you just use standard no, the best, rate? Best rate they can get is standard. There, there'll be standard smoker or standard non-smoker. There's always a possibility that they may be rated substandard if 
the Medical Information Bureau comes back with that kind of information. But assuming they're in good health, and that's why it's it's very frequently in the client's best interest uh, to go through full underwriting, to go through a paramed exam and get medical records. If it's a pretty um, better than a 50-50 chance that they're going to qualify for one of our preferred categories, even the lowest preferred category, the client's going to get a lot better more bang for their buck with this product, just like with our term product, if they go through underwriting and get preferred rather than uh, not going through underwriting and the best they can get is standard. Okay. All right. Awesome. And my next question is, is um, what is, if we want to do ex the express underwriting uh, with no physical exam, just a, yep. uh, you know, MIB and, and uh, prescription, what's the lowest face amount on this product? 25,000. Oh, really? Okay. I did not yep. know that. I did not know you could yep. go down to 25K. 25K to 99,999 is, uh, is a non-med face amount as long as the client is 50 or younger. If the client's between the ages of 51 and 60, then the uh, highest face amount they can get is 75,000 and still be non-medical. So oh, 25,000 to oh. 75,000. Yep. All right, awesome. So if you've got people who are looking at the lower face amounts because they, again, they want permanent insurance, maybe they're 57 years old and they say, well, I don't want term insurance because I might outlive it. Okay, well, then they can, they've got a choice. They can look at um, final expense, but uh, at age 57, the highest face amount they could get would be 40000 Well, maybe they want more than 40000 Well, they can get 50, 60, even 75000 uh, and in that age category and still be a non-med uh, face amount for the IUL product. Amazing. That's awesome. I did not, I did not know that. Um, with that, Ted, I do have to end the call because I do have to get into a meeting. Me too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much. Again, Joe, thanks for the opportunity to speak to your folks and uh, look forward to um, uh, answering your questions if you have them in the future or anything else that you might need, give us a buzz. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ted. Bye have a now. great day. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Have a great weekend. Jimmy, Take I care, will uh, talk, talk to you soon, man. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.